My name's Kevin Morrell. I'm two various hats, as Laura mentioned. One is the National Museum of Computing, the other is the Computer Conservation Society. Um, and I want to talk about a machine called the Harwell Computer, the Harwell Decatron Computer. Uh, it's also known as Witch. It's had several names. And I'm conscious when I've done this before, I've gone through a sort of chronological history and not done the reveal until the end. Now, that's OK if you know what the machine actually looks like. So I'm going to show you, jump ahead, way ahead, and show you the clip of the machine running and then really explain how we got to this point. So if I click on here, it's just the start. Oh, it's working. This is the Harwell Decatron computer. It is the oldest working example of a first generation computer anywhere in the world. In 1949, the Atomic Energy Research Establishment at Harwell needed to improve the efficiency, accuracy, and reliability of its calculations. By 1951, the Harwell Decatron was complete. Although it looks archaic, the Harwell Decatron has all the main functions that can be found in a modern computer. It has input, output, a processor, and memory. Modern computers are programmed using languages, but the Decatron is programmed in pure machine code. Instructions are fed in using a numeric keypad or punched paper tape. The Harwell Decatron was designed before transistors were available, so its processor is made up of valves and relays. 827 individual Decatron tubes are used to hold data and program instructions. Each Decatron tube can store a decimal number between 0 and 9. It does give the game away slightly, actually, but it's, it's, it's nice of me, I think, to see the machine um, as it is now. Uh, but I need to take you back to the start. I need to take you back to the end of the Second World War um, and explain why Harwell came about. We had shipped all of our atomic scientists, nuclear engineers and things to Los Alamos, to the States. All, all the original work on nuclear power and atomic energy was done in Europe and the UK, we shipped everybody across to the Manhattan Project in New Mexico. But there was a special relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill that all the information that was learned would be shared back with the UK at the end of the war. And that's the basis we worked on. Sadly, at the end of the war, we have Attlee in power in this country and Truman as President of the United States. The agreement that had been made had been lost. And in fact, the Americans introduced something called the McMahon Act in '46, which forbid any sharing of all of that research and that knowledge from Los Alamos. So the UK, Europe, completely abandoned by the States. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting the way that history sort of pivots in a huge way on just tiny little things. Ernest Bevan, who was the Foreign Secretary, had been over to the US and had a really rough meeting with the Secretary of State and came away extremely angry. Came back to the Cabinet and said to the Cabinet, oh, and the Cabinet was pretty divided whether to go down this route of developing atomic weapons and atomic power or not. Bevin came back, banged the table and said, we must have this thing here and it must have a bloody Union Jack flying on top of it. So the whole history of the UK changed suddenly. Um, and the decisions were made in Cabinet Nothing was mentioned until 48, in almost a sort of side issue in Parliament, and that was mentioned that we'd actually started to develop atomic power in this country. Is that me? Oh, it's my chin, isn't it? Yes. <coughs> Problem was, all the people that had come back from the Los Alamos project had worked on individual little departments. N hardly anybody had a whole view of, of the whole process. And in fact, a lot of fundamental research had just been skipped completely in Los Alamos. So things like half-lives of certain uh, of elements were just simply not known. So they had to start again. And Harwell was built it's a, next to a village just southwest of Oxford. Um, it was an old RAF base, the very first of a new range of a new series of RAF bases. And just as an aside, you should never trust version one of anything. This is version one of an airfield that was built just 
in 43. The runway was over a brow of a hill, so when you were taking off, you couldn't actually see the runway uh, until you got to the point where you were committed to take off on the brow of the hill. OK, well, that, that's manageable, that's fine. And if you have to bought the takeoff, you have to bought the takeoff. Sadly, they built the ammunition dump at the end of the runway. <laughs> so by the time you got to the brow of the hill, frankly, if your wheels went off the ground, you weren't going to get anywhere. And then it was an extremely sharp right turn to avoid the ammunition dump. That's version one. Got better, still. But Harwell had good water supply, uh, lots of big hangars around that they could actually build equipment in, and accommodation as well. And Harwell, although there were other centres in Cheshire and Windscale, Harwell was the sort of public face of atomic energy as far as the UK was concerned. And it was operated like a university almost. Everybody that works there in those early days, all they can remember is the mud everywhere, mud and chalk as they were building it. And the story is that if you get to work one morning down a particular route, when you left, they dug the road up and several people were just obliged to stay at work until they rebuilt the road. But it, I think it's a phenomenally exciting time. They built, I still want computers, I promise. They built the first nuclear reactor in Europe called Gleep, which is about the size of a sort of three-bedroom detached house. Uh, Gleep was so successful, uh, it carried on to the 1990 and was used worldwide for calibrating counters and nuclear detectors and so on. It's phenomenal. It was, there was a campaign to keep it as a national monument and unfortunately that didn't get going in time before the nuclear expectorate started to dismantle it. So sadly Gleep has gone. Not a very powerful big reactor, three kilowatts, which is about the size of an electric kettle but absolutely reliable. Now, I mentioned that uh, all the fundamental knowledge wasn't available to the UK, and in fact, a lot of the fundamental research hadn't been done. So Harwell were employing every year hundreds of maths graduates, metallurgists, physicists, chemists, and so on, to actually work um, in this sort of university environment. The, phys the physicists and the chemists had a whale of a time, really, uh, no expense spared and so on. The mathematicians had a bit more of a rough time. They were presented with tables of things like logarithms and so on. I think some of us remember logarithms from school, huge books of mathematical tables. The only mechanical aids they had were things like Brunsviga and mechanical typewriters. So everything was <coughs> absolutely manual. So if you thought you were joining the exciting world of atomic energy, you were actually presented with a whole series of differential equations, instructions how to solve them, and that could take three, four, five days of simply slogging through with arithmetic and the limited use of tables and calculators. Uh, pretty mind-numbing stuff, very error-prone, and really I think the people that were in charge of theoretical physics and maths at Harwell was slightly embarrassed about this. But at the same time, saw, uh, British Ericsson had developed something called the Decatron tube. And it's a Decatron tube that you could see spinning in some of those displays earlier. Now, they were particularly interesting for Harwell. Uh, it's not a terribly good picture, but at the end of the tube, there are 10 positions where a glow can show. So we have a counting tube that can count from naught to 10. Um, what, naught through to nine, back to, back to zero. Very clever functions on these tubes. We can supply pulses to the tube and that glow will move round. When we switch one on, it's at random. Let's say if we switch one on, it's on seven. Now if I send two pulses into the tube, it will go around to nine. So it has two functions. A, a, it's a storage device, because if you leave it alone, it'll stay storing nine. And it's an arithmetic device, because we've already added seven and two and got nine. Now, how we'll use them. Oh, the other point as well, we're, if we're on nine at the moment, I send another two pulses in, it'll go zero to one. But it sends a signal out of a carry to say that I've passed zero. Now, if you can chain a row of these together, 
you have a counter. And if you connect a Geiger Muller tube at one end, you've got a, new, a, a counter to count pulses and disintegrations. And that was perfect. And Harwell used them in the thousands. Um, as I said, Harwell was slightly embarrassed, really, about the sort of mundane jobs they were getting these bright graduates to do. And, and a chance conversation, really, over the garden fence between the, one of the theoretical physicists and the electronics division said, well, actually, I wonder if we could automate this. I wonder if we could actually build a computer to do this. And this is really 47. Three members of the electronics department, Ted Cook Yarborough, Dick Barnes and Gurney Thomas, had actually been going backwards and forwards to Cambridge at this point when they had enough petrol to, get in, to actually get there and had seen EDSAC being built. So they had an idea. Ted Cook Yarborough knew about electronics. Dick Barnes knew about control systems. And Gurney Thomas knew about memory systems. <clears throat> so they thought they could actually do this. So they had to make a case for Harwell for spending this time and this money to actually do this. And they had to make the case to Sir John Cockcroft, who was in charge of Harwell, and his second in command, who was in, in charge of theoretical physics, and that's Klaus Fuchs. Klaus Fuchs was very, very, very valuable to the UK project. He spent a lot of time in Los Alamos, had a very, very good memory, kept copious notes of everything he'd learnt and understood. Now, it wasn't actually discovered till much later that the reason he was keeping the copious notes, he was actually passing them to his Russian controller every, every evening. But that aside, that aside, he, had, he was the only person that had an overall view of what was actually going on, so it was invaluable to the UK. Um, when our three bright chaps, Ted, Dick and Gurney, go to present this and build in this computer, they would expect three or four hours of knockabout discussion and argument <coughs> and so on. When they got there, it was a very, very quiet conversation. Uh, Cockcroft didn't look very happy. Fuchs looked seriously unhappy. And the whole thing was over in 15 minutes. And they were told, well, if you think you can do it, you better go away and do it. Well, that chap was sort of, OK, well, in one hand, yes, we've been told we can get on and do this. Odd situation. Many years later, it was discovered that that morning of that conversation, Cockcroft had finally been told that he's second in command at Harwell was a Russian spy. And Fuchs had been arrested, finally arrested that, that morning. So I think they had probably had more on their minds than my three engineers with their song and dance show about building a computer. But they got permission to do that. And they built the machine, started in early 1950, and completed by 51, with what's called two store groups now these are the excuse me, pointing, these are the store groups here, those. And it was incredibly successful. Um, what I hadn't mentioned before, although some of the accumulator is electronic, the memory is these decatron tubes are electronic, and we saw decatron tubes spinning around relatively fast, but they will actually spin up to about 50 kilohertz. So they're quite fast. That centre section, covered in the metal tube-like covers, are all relays. And it's relays that control the process of the machine. And relays don't go at 50 kilohertz at all. They go very, very slowly. So this machine, typically, to do an add, adding two floating point numbers, uh, would take about nine seconds. Uh, to multiply two floating point numbers, it would take, no, fixed point numbers, sorry, fixed point numbers, to multiply two, it would take the best part of 18 seconds. Now, that's desperately slow. It's desperately slow compared with Ed Sack one that was down the road, but it was incredibly reliable. These guys knew how to build equipment that was absolutely reliable <coughs> and faultless. So the argument was that, OK, Ed Sack was very fast, but probably only worked for 15 minutes before it failed again, whereas this would actually work over weekends and weeks long and do a similar amount of work. Um, so it's very reliable, it's handed over to the mathematicians. They started to learn how to program the machine. 
Um, and albeit very slow, it was very successful. Now, lots of people talked about machine code programming earlier uh, and put their hands up. This is the only operations that you've got. This is the complete machine code instruction for the machine. You can test for positive or negative in the accumulator. You can jump. <laughs> you can jump based on that test. So we have a conditional jump. Um, in terms of my arithmetic, uh, arithmetic, we can add, subtract, multiply and divide in hardware, which is relatively unusual, uh, and modulus and so on. That's absolutely enough. If you've got a conditional jump, and frankly subtract, you've got enough as a general purpose computer. And typically programs are written with a bootstrap, and a bootstrap program would clear various stores, perhaps reading constants from another tape. Um, I'll show you the paper tapes in a moment. And then transfer, you could call subroutines on another tape, paper tape drive. So typically that's how they're written. And we have a subroutine on the right, which I think just squares the, squares the value that's provided in the accumulator and returns. That's the physical representation of a subroutine. <coughs> It's literally a paper tape that's glued either end. So when we call that subroutine on tape reader, I can't read that, three I think it is, it will read the code from that routine and stop at the, at the return instruction. And of course, because the paper tape's glued, next time we call it, it's ready to actually run again. Now that's tiny, that subroutine. Um, some of the routines that were run later involved having two huge bins either side and, and the pa tapes were 40, 50, 60 feet long. But it worked very well. As I said, it's a complete programming language. No high level language, there's not enough store for anything like that. So everything's programmed in machine code. I said it was a slow machine. It was really designed to do at about the same rate as a, as a sort of mathematician would use with a mechanical calculator. Now, there's a story of a race. Bart Fossey was a brilliant mathematician. And this story grew and grew. Basically, the, one of the big problems on a machine like this is rounding errors. So if you have a machine which is calculating, endlessly calculating based on, the, on previous results, any rounding errors, by the time you finish, are going to be absolutely pointless results. So Bart sat down next to the machine to do the same job mechanically, um, but actually kept up for about half an hour and then retired exhausted and the machine carried on. Typically, it was left on for days and days and days. Um, in a report from Ted Cook Yarbrough, running 80 hours, running 55% of the time, that point in the early 50s, that's quite phenomenal. Nothing else came anywhere near that sort of level. Um, emitting a five-week pause due to damage. Um, that's quite fun. Ted Cook Yard was in charge of the whole department at that point. Late at night, wants to change one of the memory units, so gets a step ladder up behind the machine, reaches over and knocks it over, literally the whole lot. <laughs> and that's the five weeks. The general feeling was that, thank God, it was the boss that had done it and not anybody else, but uh, it was the boss that did it. So that's the five weeks. It's not mentioned in Ted's report about why the five weeks was unavailable, but that, that, that was the reason. Uh, we talked about a charmed life. By 1957, Harwell had actually moved on. They'd built something called Cadet, which is a transistorized computer, the first completely transistorized computer. Ted Cook Yarbrough had been over to Bell Laboratories in the US to see the first point contact germanium transistors. They were told originally that you cannot take any out of the lab at all. None can be removed, the supply is so short. Ted Cook Yarba smuggled half a dozen back in his socks, <laughs> literally stuffed them in his socks um, and came back. By the time they came back, within six months, Harwell had produced a book on transistor theory and suggested circuits, much to the annoyance of Bell. But by 55, they're available generally, and they built the, the cadet. They had access to other machines as well. Um, by that stage, you could buy 
commercial machines not quite off the shelf, but at least to order. But, but such was the, really the love of this machine, because everybody used it, but still trying to use it. Um, they organized a competition to see if we could find a winner, uh, to see if we could find a further education establishment, university or a college, that put together a bid to have the machine. It was organized by the Ath uh, Oxford Mathematical Institute. 30 submissions came in, it was a short list of nine. Our winners, which I'll come on to in a moment, turned up with the Lord Mayor in his chains, the whole of the department, and put together their case for winning it. And the winners were the Wolverhampton College of Technology. They uh, made a huge fuss, and this is, this is very valuable to us as a museum. The chap in charge of the department, Cecil Ramsbottom, loved publicity. Any excuse to get the college in the papers, the TV, anything he would do. So we have a wealth of sort of information about this. Whether they understood what they got is another matter. Uh, one of the things they sold it for, um, it can, for instance, work out wage calculations much, quick, much more quickly than a human being. It seriously couldn't, I'm afraid. <laughs> Absolutely seriously couldn't at all. But they promised a local industry that they would actually have access to the machine as well. And they'd raised funds for this. Um, but they're very chuffed. They organised... Ah, yes, point, point. They renamed the machine, rather than calling it the hardware machine. Now, usual with acronyms, which came first is not exactly clear. But they renamed it as the Wolverhampton Institute instrument for teaching com computing from Harwell. Uh, and again, got that in the, in the local papers, the Birmingham papers, and the Wolverhampton Express and Star. But started with the machine, the first undergraduate course in 65. And we have a picture of, I think there are 12 undergraduates. They're all 18 and 19, um, starting on that course. That same group, who have now just all retired, came back to the museum last year so we have a matching photograph of them in front of the machine, as they are now. Interestingly, um, IBM had heard about Wolverhampton in teaching computing. And IBM turned up in the third year of this undergraduate course and offered them all jobs. And all but one actually then worked for IBM for the rest of their lives. So it was useful that they all kept in touch about this. They were... Uh, Use the machine with sort of local schools, local grammar schools, and again, these are all publications from uh, local papers and so on. They promised help for local industry, and one of the industries in Wolverhampton is key making, and the Chubb company are making Chubb blocks. One of the problems with making certain mortis, no, mortis keys, certain keys is the pins need to be a certain width. There are only certain, uh, uh, otherwise they'll actually snap off. There are only certain designs. And the witch computer was used by these two gentlemen to actually solve the problem and produce key patterns for um, the Chubb company. They made a few hardware changes as well. The chap on the left is a chap called Peter Burden, who was a sixth former, um, was waiting to go to Cambridge to read maths, so he used the machine in his summer holidays. We'll come on to Peter later because he reappears in our story. Um, Harwell used it until 73. This is the second retirement of the machine. Um, and again, Cecil Ramsbottom as a self-publicist as well. What machine listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's most durable computer? Um, there's a whole load, uh, there's endless, there was endless press coverage. ATV, the local sort of independent <coughs> TV station, did some uh, recording there as well, which is sadly lost, which would be absolutely wonderful to see. But there's a whole champagne reception. And the next decision was what to actually do with the machine. And absolutely no, nobody would let it be dismantled. So it went to Birmingham Science Museum. Now, I grew up in Birmingham. Uh, it's not a terribly good picture of the Science Museum. It was a huge ramshackle place, absolutely fantastic, unbelievable. And I sort of spent, I sort of geeky teenagers, spent sort of every Saturday afternoon actually at Birmingham Science Museum for many, many years. This next picture, my mum reckons it's me. I'm bloody sure it's not, but still. And there's me with my mother standing next to me looking at the Science Museum. I'm pretty sure it's not me. I think she's just doolally, still. 
Anyhow, it was on display at Birmingham Science Museum until 1997. Let's get a move on. Um, when, it, when it was taken off display, the third retirement, and went to a sort of collection centre in uh, central Birmingham. Now, by this stage, I'm involved in the Computer Conservation Society and was going to Birmingham to do some sort of audit of equipment that they've got. And I saw right at the back of that, those three odd shaped things. I thought, bloody hard to recognise that. That's from the, the witch computer. It took quite a while and we put together, oh, let's go back a bit, jump in again, to dig all of that equipment out and find it. But we eventually found what we thought was a good 60, 70% of the machine. Yes, I realise I'm doing accelerate. We had to make decisions about what we were going to do with the machine. Uh, we found in the Birmingham Collection Centre this store of components, which is fantastic. The bottom of that box includes all the circuit diagrams as well, which is unbelievable. We also got back in touch with Dick Barnes and Ted Cook Yarborough, got some information from them, and then set up the working party persuading Birmingham Museums and County Council that we could have the machine, and the machine was brought to TNMOC. I'll, I'm going to skip that. That's the unloading of the van that was actually on BBC uh, News one evening. Then the restoration process started. It's in quite a sorry state. Um, it had suffered, really, um, at, at, at Wolverhampton, not being looked after as well as it might have been. But by, we had help from Dick Barnes again, and of course, we've got the benefit of modern equipment to restore this. So in 2000 and... I can't remember. About five years, exactly five years ago. The machine was restored. We had the reboot event. And the reboot event had the, the original designers and the users of the machine brought back in. That was televised worldwide. The YouTube video went to a million hits over the same weekend. Quite a phenomenal event. The machines now, actually about this time of day, will be in use. There'll be an education party at the museum and they will be brought code in and be running code on the machine. It's incredibly reliable. It's, it, it's, it's really quite a wonder. Um, there are future plans. Um, there are various books. It's useful when you've done a huge amount of research, write a book because then you can actually gradually forget it all knowing it's in the book. Very useful. Um, We've built the simulation and the emulation at the moment as well, uh, and there's a web accessible emulator coming up, at the, uh, coming up soon. Um, <clears throat> there's some thought that a few people want to make a sort of smaller replica of it, and there have been electronic replicas of it using sort of LEDs arranged like Decatrons. So there's a lot going on with the machine. I'll show you this video because it recaps the last that didn't work, did it? Oh, here we go. This is the Harwell Decatron computer. It is the oldest working example of a first-generation computer anywhere in the world. In 1949, the Atomic Energy Research Establishment at Harwell needed to improve the efficiency, accuracy, and reliability of its calculations. By 1951, the Harwell Decatron was complete. Although it looks archaic, the Harwell Decatron has all the main functions that can be found in a modern computer. It has input, output, a processor, and memory. That print has been wound on manually. It's a con. The Decatron is programmed in pure machine code. Instructions are fed in using a numeric keypad or punched paper tape. The Harwell Decatron was designed before transistors were available. So its processor is made up of valves and relays. 827 individual Decatron tubes are used to hold data and program instructions. Each Decatron tube can store a decimal number between 0 and 9. Rather than show the results on a screen, the Harwell Decatron would either print them or punch holes in paper tape. In 1957, transistorization made the Harwell Decatron obsolete. The Atomic Energy Research Establishment launched a competition to give away their machine. The competition was won by Wolverhampton and Staffordshire College of Technology, who renamed it The Witch. This stood for the Wolverhampton Instrument for Teaching Computation from Harwell. 
The college used the witch for 16 years between 1957 and 1973. The witch helped teach scores of students about computing. In 1973, it took another journey to the Birmingham Museum of Science and Industry, where it was on display for many years. By 1983, the witch was no longer working. The artist John Eaton painted the computer when it was out of use and called his composition Portrait of a Dead Witch. The painting is now on display in the Jam Street Cafe in Manchester. In 2009, the Harwell Decatron was brought to the National Museum of Computing to be restored to working order. In 2014, it was recognised by Guinness World Records as the world's oldest working original computer. Thank you.